Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. 1 John, that you may know, that you may know what? The light that we walk in. This morning we are specifically going to look at Fellowship Conduct Part 2. Last week we saw Fellowship Conduct Part 1, and this week Fellowship Conduct Part 2. And that should actually read verse 7 through 14 and not verse 6 through 14. It was a long day yesterday. We continue this morning in our study of the second chapter of 1 John. We saw last week that those who claim to be followers of Jesus have certain conduct parameters which will reveal they are truly followers of Jesus. We continue in that same theme this morning in part two of our study of fellowship conduct. So let's look again closely at verses 7 and 8. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. First notice that in verse 7, John begins with beloved. Beloved. It's the Greek word Adelphoi, which is normally translated as brother. About half of our modern English translations translated here as brethren, the plural of brother, and the other half as beloved. When used in this form, it's often used in a spiritual sense, which is why it's translated as, uh, as brethren or spiritual brothers. This, is because, this becomes important because John is making sure that his, rec, his readers recognize that he's writing to fellow believers. He's writing to people that he recognizes as fellow believers. He's not writing to the world at all, as a whole. He's writing to fellow believers. Those who have stated they are walking the same path as Jesus. He's not writing to the world in general but to followers of Jesus. The rest of the verse is a little more confusing at first. John says that he's writing to his spiritual brethren no new commandment, but is giving them an old commandment, which they had from the beginning. So there's a couple of things we got to figure out from this sentence. In verse 7, John says it's not a new commandment, but in verse 8, he calls it a new commandment. So as you're reading this for the first time, you go, okay, John, which is it? A new commandment or an old commandment? I mean, as John gets older, he sounds more and more like the Apostle Paul all the time. One commandment is both old and new. So what is the command? We'll see later in this pericope that the command is the requirement to love your brother as proof of your walking in the light. Now, he takes a while to develop that for us, but he says, I'm not giving you a new commandment. And then he says, but it is a new commandment. And so we need to, we need to look at that. When John calls it an old commandment that they've had from the beginning, what's he referring to? The beginning of what? Some argue he's speaking of the beginning of the law and the part of what, uh, as a part of what God gave Israel. Well, certainly... Uh, we have been given instruction in the Old Testament. We've been given law in the Old Testament. But in the context of who John is writing to, Ephesian Gentiles, it seems unlikely that he's talking about the Old Testament law. He says, from the beginning. But that doesn't seem like it would mean from the beginning of, of the law. Plus, John does not say that the commandment was from the beginning but his beloved had it from the beginning. So notice what he says here. Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment, 
not that was from the beginning, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. So it's part of what they had learned, part of what they had been instructed in since they had been getting biblical instruction. I think John is talking about the message that Jesus brought that they had learned from John. Remember, he was one of the inner, inner circle of Jesus. He, went, he traveled with Jesus. He was there for those, those big inner circle, inner three moments when uh, he, he got to witness mighty things from Jesus, thinking most specifically of the, the Mount of Transfiguration, when he got to see what Jesus would be like in glorified form along with Moses and Elijah. So he's bringing to the people what he received from Jesus from the beginning of Jesus' ministry as the Apostle John walked with him. So as he wrote the Gospel of John, I would assume that he also taught through the life of Jesus as he wrote about it in the Gospel of John. As he's, as he's remembering all the things that Jesus did, that works its way into the teaching that he gave every week to the church there in Ephesus and in other places. And so part of the message from the beginning was the example that Jesus provided of loving your brother. The sense that the commandment is new is that there is now the power within the readers to actually fulfill it. So he says in verse 7, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. Then in verse 8, at the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. What do we get when we become followers of Jesus? We get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which gives you the power to be obedient. <coughs> Excuse me. Power to be obedient to God and the commands that he gives you. You don't have the power within you, in your natural self, to love others, especially the unlovable. You have power to love your family, you have power to love your friends, but sacrificial love is not really within you, without the power of God. Except for those rare occasions when we see someone doing something magnanimous, apart from the, the work of God. I think most, most often when we look at, at, uh, at our, our soldiers that, that uh, receive the Medal of Honor and the things that they did to protect their fellow soldier, that would be an exception. But the vast majority of the world doesn't have the power to love the unlovable when, without the, the Holy Spirit. And so as we become followers of Jesus and we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we receive the power to love each other, it becomes part of what we do. And in that sense, it's a new commandment because now you actually have the power to fulfill the commandment. At the end of verse 8, John states that the command is true in Jesus and in us because the light is shining. Remember what we saw in First Peter a while back. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow his steps. Jesus set the example, and then John faithfully taught that example to his, his followers, how we're to live, how we're to do things for each other. Jesus set the example of loving our brother. Now go back to, to 1 John. Look at verse 9. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Remember, we're, we're still in the section which is talking about how those who claim fellowship with God and with each other are to act. How we're to act as followers of Jesus. Those who follow Jesus walk in the light. We saw last week, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his command is a liar, and the truth is not in him. If you say you love God, but you 
aren't a follower of Jesus, you're a liar. Back to verse 9. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. I like what J. Vernon McGee, old-time uh, through-the-Bible preacher from West Texas. I can't do his voice as well as Dan could, but uh, here's what he says on this subject. It's impossible for you as a child of God to walk in the light and hate your brother. If you do hate another Christian, it means there's something radically wrong with your confession of faith. I read that the other day and I thought, wow, that's, that's about as easy and simple as it can get. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but you hate your brother, there's something radically wrong with something somewhere. Because those two things are incongruent. They don't go together. You can't say, I'm a follower of Jesus and then hate your brother. And I, I, I like the simplicity that J. Vernon writes it. Then there's something radically wrong with your confession of faith. He doesn't come right out and say it, but he's implying that if you say you're a follower of Jesus and you hate your brother, maybe your confession is not legitimate. Maybe you're not actually a follower of Jesus which would be borne out by the fact that you're not going in the same direction as Jesus. Jesus provided a perfect example. He sacrificed himself. And when I say sacrificed himself, I mean more than just physically. I want you to think about, think about the sacrifice Jesus made. Jesus is the creator, sustainer of the universe. He's the member of the triune Godhead that put the Father's plan into, into effect. He put the plan into effect of creation and of salvation. Before the box was created by God, he already, he already decided that Jesus would someday not only maintain the box, but step into the box. Now imagine you... Just imagine, if, if it's possible to think on this scale. Imagine you created the world, standing outside of the world, outside of time. You created it all. And then you said, okay, I'm going to step into my creation. I'm going to subject myself to, to the creation. Not just step into the world, Continue to maintain the world while you step into the world. But not just step into the world. Confine yourself into Mary's womb for nine months. And then contain yourself while maintaining the world with needing someone to clean your diaper and to feed you and to pick you up and to dress your knee when you fell down. And as you got older and you're swinging the hammer in the, in the workshop and you hit your thumb and... All of that goes into our learning how to, how to live. He created the world, maintains the world, and then became an insi what appeared to be an insignificant part of the world. So much so that even after he became publicly known, one of the guys that would, uh, <clears throat> would soon become one of his disciples say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, he was in a part of the world that we would look at as, as the armpit of the world. So he creates the world, maintains the world, and then steps into the womb, the dirty diaper, and the backwoods of the world. But that's not even all of the sacrifice. The sacrifice continues on ultimately going to a cruel, cruel final 12 hours that we call the end of the Passion Week as he's beaten and whipped and eventually nailed to a cross and dies. But that's still not all of the sacrifice. Remember what he said on the cross as the Father places the sin of the entirety of the world on his back and he cries out in, in agony, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting from the Psalms, as 
for the first time in eternity, there is a fracture in the triune relationship. And God turns his back on him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he pays the penalty. He created it all, and then as a result of becoming part of it, had a fracture in his relationship with his father. That's the sacrifice. That's the example that Jesus sets for us. Jesus did all that for people that didn't even like him and most hated him. Remember, as he walked around in Israel, sure, there were a bunch of people that followed him that really liked him because he could feed them with a couple of loaves and fishes. And if they got sick, he could heal them. And if they died, he could raise them. So there's a bunch of people following him that were really attracted to the, to the coolness of that that re- ended up rejecting him. They didn't love him, but he died for them anyway. And then there's all those people that actually hated him. You know, the Romans and everybody in our time period that is anti-God, that, that says God doesn't exist. He died for them. He created the box and stepped into the box, went through the pain and agony of the box and the separation from God for people that hated him. That's the example we're to live up to. It's a tall order. But that's what John is, is reminding the people of here. Remember one of his close associates and John's close friend, Peter, on the night that Jesus was arrested. He thought he was going to be the tough man and, and was going to defend Jesus. And then a few hours later, cusses out a little girl. No, I don't, didn't even know the guy. I don't know who you're talking about. And yet he died for them. That's the example. So when we claim to be a follower of Jesus... When we claim to be led by someone like Jesus and yet we don't love our brothers, we are so far from following him. Not even close to following him when we hate our brother. We're not just walking in the other direction, we're running in the other direction. We can't claim to be a follower of Jesus and then say we hate our brother. We have this fight within us that happens true evidence of a redeemed heart is that you now have the capacity to love others and to put others needs above your own not loving your brother does not cause you to lose your salvation but it doesn't reflect properly on your salvation either remember that verse 10 whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling when you follow Jesus' example and you love your brothers, it's, it becomes clear that you are a follower of Jesus. When you act like Jesus, it looks like you're following Jesus. When you don't act like Jesus, it looks like you're not following Jesus. The second half of the verse is a, a little more complex. The Greek word for no cause for stumbling is one simple word, scandalone, from where we get scandalous. The root word is based on a trap or a snare in which small animals are captured. The idea is is when we follow Jesus and actively do what he tells us to do, there's no little snare or, or trap to get you. There's no potential, real potential for scandal when you follow Jesus, when you do what he tells you to do. By remaining close to Jesus, we don't run into traps that sin sets for us. But the inverse of verse 10 is seen in verse 11. I pressed the button too many times. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You ever been in a really dark area? I mean, really, really dark. When I was a a kid, 
in our house on Flora Avenue, my dad and I built a dark room. We love to do for photography, and, and we, we, uh, we tested it to see how dark it was. And, I mean, it was pitch black. That's the only way you could, back then you could do color photos. You had to have it pitch black because just a, just a stray piece of light would, would ruin your film when you went to process it. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't but this wide. You know, a counter over here and a counter over here. And it was very easy to, everything was right in reach. But as soon as the lights went off, you were completely disoriented. Which way was I facing? You know, and you're, you have to do everything by feel. And the first time we took film, out, back then, you know, you take film out of a canister and we had to put it in a, in a reel just right. And then you had to put the lid on just right so that you could then turn the lights on to process it. Well, you, you, have, to, you have to do all of that in the, in the absolute total darkness. And it's disorienting. That's exactly what John is talking about here. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and, and bumps into things because the darkness has blind you, you're blind. You can't see where you're going. You can't, you can't even figure it out because you have no frame of reference in the dark. So when, when, when we're in the darkness, we don't know how to do the right thing. We can't figure it out. We can't find the right direction to go in. When we walk with Jesus, we're in the light. And we see where we're going. We see the traps that are being laid for us on the road. But when we're in the darkness, we don't see any of that. We fall into the trouble every time. John now changes the style of his writing for the next few verses. I hope in your... In your uh, printed Bibles, and maybe even, probably even on your computers, you see that these next um, three verses look different in the text. We've been talking about that on Wednesday evening. There's something else that happens in this text, and you're to treat it a little bit different. In the original Greek, we see a highly structured format, which is almost poetic. It's not quite a poem, but it's kind of like a little, a little ditty for, for his readers to remember so that they can, they can easily assimilate the, the data. Let's take a look at these, at these verses. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the words of God abides in you and have overcome the evil one. You should... Uh, you should be aware now enough of the process to go through the text that there are some things that are important in what's being said. Anybody want to take a wild guess what it is? What's the phrase? What's being repeated? I write to you. He just hammered. It's actually written. It's, in Greek, it's more interesting because there's two different words for write. And he plays them off of each other. It's almost, a, it's almost a word play. And in Greek, it's much more interesting. We lose so much of it in, in English. But notice that what John says here. He says, I write to you little children in verse 12, to fathers in verse 13, to young men in verse 13, children again in verse 13, fathers in 14, young men in 14. What's he doing? Is he talking about different age groups? That's the normal way we would see this. So who are these children, fathers, and young men? There's considerable debate among scholars and theologians if John divided the church by physical age or by spiritual age or what he really meant here. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you. I don't think that he means anything by the use of these different uh, groupings. I think they're all kind of terms of endearment for the totality of the people. Um, it's, it's, interest, it's more interesting in Greek than it is in English. 
Uh, it would seem to me that both chronological age and spiritual age would be strange because fathers is in the middle of the list. And so he's not going, he's not going, you know, what children, young men, fathers. He's got fathers in the middle of both lists. So spiritual age and chronological age doesn't seem to, to fit there. The most common solution to the question is that John is using different terms of endearment for the entire congregation. We see that in other places of Scripture where multiple ages, chronological and spiritual, are addressed like this as a way of including everyone in the group. Because he was, he was doing kind of a rhyme that, that hammered the, 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 the process home, he uses multiple words, so it doesn't, it's not, he's not saying the same thing the same way multiple times. I think that's what's going on. John, in addressing the, congrega- the entire congregation, reminds them that their sins are forgiven, that they have known Jesus from the beginning, that in following Jesus they've overcome the evil one. Because we have a relationship with the Father, because we have strength, and because we have the Word of God abiding in us. He writes in a fashion of rhythm to make it easier to remember and hold on to. We may in fact have, hang on for this, to this now, we may in fact have the first Christian rap. <laughs> I'm not a good pronouncer, but if you were to read this in a staccato fashion in Greek, it's, it's almost rap-like. Now, they didn't have an idea about rap 2,000 years ago. But this would be a passage you could easily turn in the original language into a rap. He's writing it in a way, remember what the influence of the people was. You've all seen people at the Western Wall praying. And they're, they're doing this as they pray. It's keeping time. They're praying in a rhythm. And this is written in that kind of fashion so that the people could recite this and remember what's really important. <coughs> that God has provided for us and indwells us and directs us. All of that is carried out in the way this is, is written. And I wouldn't be surprised if we had the ability to go back and look at video of the day that people of John's church during the day would be, would be singing this or saying this to themselves. They, they would be going through the, the text. I'm, I'm writing to you little children because of your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. It's, a sh- it's much shorter in Greek. There's several words less in Greek. And it's just a, a, a pithy little saying to, to remind them that uh, we're saved for his sake, not ours. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. They would be reciting this over and over again and they would learn it and internalize it. I think that's what was going on and why it's recorded like it is. So what do we what do we do with this? The reality of our situation is that how we live and how we act is a reflection of our heart. You know what's said, what's done is truly a reflection of what you think, of who we follow. If we're believers who actively are following Jesus, it will be apparent that we are going in the same direction as Jesus. We're doing what Jesus wants us to do because we follow him, which includes that we love our brothers, following the example Jesus set for us. This can only be a reality in our life because we do have faith in Jesus. You don't have the capacity to love everybody apart from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. John also recognized that 
the time was difficult and would be difficult in the future. Remember, most of the church was an enemy of the state. Most of the church was ostracized from their families and from their businesses and so forth. It was a difficult time. And yet they were still called to love the people around them. He was present when Jesus told the disciples that following him would be difficult. So John provided the first century follower of Jesus a rhythmic post, perhaps the first Christian rap that reminds his readers that they are forgiven, have a relationship with Jesus and with the Father, that they've overcome Satan with the word of God abiding in them. How dynamic is that? That with the word of God indwelling us, we've overcome the work of Satan in our world. Don't forget that. John wants to give us direction and also to encourage us to keep on following Jesus because that's the only way that people will know that we're followers of Jesus, that we actually look like we're going in the direction he's going in. God called us to follow Jesus and look like him and do what he told us to do and be obedient to him. We have to look different than the rest of the world. Father, thank you for that truth. Thank you for the reality that you've called us to be your children. You've called us to look different from the world. In the Old Testament, we saw all of the, the teaching of clean and unclean. And you, in the New Testament, remind us we're to be holy because you're holy. We're to look like you. Thank you for the example of Jesus. Thank you for the teaching of John to remind us that it's going to be difficult, but we still need to be obedient. We love you and we want to serve you. And we think of all of those that are traveling or absent from us today, that you would just watch over them and protect them. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.